Hi, everyone. Welcome. So, I am thrilled to have our second Q&A with Dr. Michael Merzenich and myself. I'm obviously both delighted and profoundly honored to be uh, collaborating here with uh, uh, Dr. Merzenich. And um, I w will, uh, s first of all, t uh, maybe say a few words for those of you who don't know yet who are here for the first time. So, Dr. Michael Merzenich is a professor emer em emeritus at the University of California at San Francisco, a member of both the National Academy of Science and the Institute of Medicine, and the co-founder of the Scientific Learning and Posit Science. He's often called the father of brain plasticity, and he is one of the scientists responsible for our current understanding of brain change across the lifespan. Uh, I'm going to get off text here, just a few sentences. Uh, anything written in this is uh, going to fall way short of the enormity of this man's accomplishments, brilliance, and, and size. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. You're s <laughs> you've lost weight. <laughs> and and um, a humanity. I think one of the things that really draws me. Uh, to Mike is, and I said it uh, before, is his deep care for people, his humanity, and his interest and commitment to bring the knowledge he, he has and the understanding of how the brain works into a, a practical applications to help make people's lives better. And I think that's definitely one of the places that we connect. So. I'm a huge fan of his. I've been a f I have been a groupie before I met him <laughs> through reading <laughs> about his research. And when I got to meet Mike, I really felt that the gods were on my side. And I still feel that way. So this is Mike. And uh, I, uh, the, we, we have done the, the first uh, Q&A. And we have both felt that there is room to focus a bit more and uh, um, so that we've created a structure and we're going to experiment with it. Uh, uh, Mike is going to talk for, uh, I don't know, however long he wants, uh, mostly based on his new book, uh, Softwired. And I will talk a few minutes in terms of what I, uh, about the ABM and that Baniel method. And then we will leave the rest of the time for Q&A. And the way we were looking to do it, if it works for you guys as in the audience, is that you address one question to Mike and he answers. And then if there's anything I think I can add from my point of view, m more in terms of the practical movement aspect of uh, what or, that or, which or would. Or correction. <laughs> <laughs> you think he's joking. <laughs> <laughs> but the first time that I met with him, first of all, I was so very excited that I couldn't shut up because I wanted to tell him that which finally there was somebody that understood what I was talking about. And then when it was all over, I didn't quite tell that to Mike fully. I drove home and I was horrified <laughs> because I thought, oh my God, here I was with Dr. Mersenik and I didn't give him space to talk. And <laughs> I thought, that's the last I'll ever hear from him. And then I was invited back and I didn't ask why, I just said yes. And then as I was coming up the elevator, I was thinking, I wonder why he asked me back. And, and then s pretty soon he told me that he liked, uh, yeah, so while we were talking, I got into it pretty intensely and he said something and I just disagreed with him. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it just came out of my mouth. So he told me that he likes that in people. So I felt even luckier. <laughs> it was, I wasn't rejected for that. Anyway, um, you will ask him, and then if there's anything I disagree with, I'll let you know. And then you address a question over to me, and I'll do it from my point of view. And what I'd, l I'd like to try and do, if I can, is do very quick demonstrations, either hands-on kind of demonstrations to show you how, what I, what, uh, to demonstrate the answer, or as a whole group. 
if I am offering to do it one-on-one, uh, -on -one, we'll bring you up here and then know that you're on a camera and you will give us a video release form. Because one of the things that we need, we, we're doing it for, is to actually get, put it on, uh, you know, on the internet, YouTube, so people, any number of people could have access to those Q&As. Because as you know, those of you were here at the, it, it, Mike's first uh, um, book party, how valuable those answers are, okay? So Mike, okay. it's all yours. Well, thank you. Uh, it's really nice to be here. And, and uh, I listened to Annette and, uh, and I was patient with her because I largely agreed with what she told me. And I saw in her, and I've always seen in her, a really enlightened practitioner. Somebody that, coming from a different uh, a point, to, uh, a different, with a very different history on a parallel path, developed a very a common, strongly overlapping perspective about how to approach helping people be better and stronger. And I want to start by saying a little bit about my book, because for those of you who don't know about it or are in the, in the audience and haven't read it or, or, or don't know what it's about, I want to try to get you to, uh, to, to, to uh, buy it. It's not very expensive. It's not about making money. It's not about that at all. It's about helping you have a better older life. And that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I began to understand quite a few years ago as a scientist that we have a brain that's plastic. And I began to understand myself what that meant. It meant that our brain is continu continuously changing by what we do. And what we do really matters. Because what we do represents the basis of the creation of the person we are. And because the brain is plastic, we're subject to continuous revision. Now that revision can be in a positive direction. You can move in a positive direction. And that's what my book is about. It's trying to explain to you how to think about what you should be doing to move your brain in a positive direction. And who the hell wouldn't want to do that, really? Because we're all capable at any point of life of being better next week, of being better next year. That's also what Annette's uh, practices are all about. It's about being better next week. It's about being better next year. And we have this power in us because we're actually constructed to create the person we are within our lifetimes, within our skulls. So in my book, you have to go through a certain level of science of explanation, because I am a nerd, okay? But don't, don't let that intimidate you. You should know these things. Everyone should know these things. People should understand that they've been given this great gift, that they have the gift to change themselves, to transform themselves even. And one of the wonderful things about plasticity is, is it doesn't pay too much attention to where you've been, it doesn't pay too much attention to the struggles that you've had in life, it's still there with you as a resource. It's still with, the, with you to, to make your life better, and, and it, can, it can be the basis of miracles in a life. It can be. So anyway, uh, read the book, and, and if you want to gain a little bit more about this perspective. Also, it's Christmas. So if you know somebody that's struggling out there, buy them the damn book, right? <laughs> Give it to them and make them read it. Okay, be a good uh, daughter or, or mother or uncle or whatever you are. I also came here with a friend. And the friend is a man that I first met uh, about a year ago. And uh, my, my pal is Rex Lippman, who's sitting in the front, front row. And Rex uh, comes to us from Adelaide, Australia. And I might say Rex came here by himself uh, two days ago. He's 92 years old, so he, but that's just not a problem for him. He, because he's full of life, and actually a life is not as big a challenge as it is for him as it is for most 92-year-olds. So he's going back in, in two more days. And he's got to go back because he's got a lot of fish to fry in Australia. I'll, I just want to say a little bit about Rex because I'm going to call on Rex to answer a few of the questions that you might raise in the audience because he's had a lot of experience in life. So I want to tell you a little bit about him. So Rex grew up in Adelaide. His father was a, a dentist, he had a very good family, and uh, he began working in life during the Depression when he was 15 years old, and he worked for several years, and ultimately, before, and, and because Australia basically had to go to war with, with Britain, he cheated a little bit to get into the military early. He was actually 
the youngest lieutenant in the Australian Army at the first part of the war because he was a cheater. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, his military career was, was uh, probably most remarkable for the fact that he survived it. So Rex, among other things, was a commando on Japanese occupied territory in the islands of the north of Australia, uh, where most many people that had that kind of duty, that had that kind of wartime responsibility, didn't survive. And he knows that he's a very lucky person to have gotten through that in life. And he went on to come back, ultimately to be a military leader back in Adelaide after the war, after a distinguished military career. And, uh, and at the same time, he's struggled with what he might do in life. His father had been a very uh, well-known dentist in Adelaide, so he went to dental school, and Rex became a dentist. I might say that Rex has had a life of transformation. He went to, from first being a soldier, he thought he'd be a soldier perhaps for life, but the next thing you know, he's a practicing dentist, and he's a very prominent dentist, one of the most distinguished dentists in his nation. But pretty soon, uh, he's called upon because he speaks fluent French in Adelaide, and because the the people of Adelaide are, are all up in arms about the French because their nuclear testing, testing hydrogen bombs in Atoll, not too far away from Australia. The, the, uh, the French desperately needed a consulate, you know, a council official in Adelaide, so Rex said, well, why not? I'll do it. I'll take it on as a volunteer. Well, it turns out he was a French consul for, for 14 or 15 years, and meanwhile, uh, because he met people through his French consulate experience in banking, he became a banker. So pretty soon, <laughs> he's left Adelaide and he's the head of a division of a big bank in Adelaide. And pretty soon, he's a little bit dissatisfied. His life is not complete enough and he decides to uh, raise racehorses. <laughs> so on his beautiful farm near Adelaide, he raised some of the great horses, uh, spent time there in his stables, some of the great horses in Australia in this era, uh, traded, uh, uh, trained by one of the great trainers in Australian, hit greatest trainers in Australian history. Uh, most people would, at some point at this point, you know, Rex is getting on towards the age that we could say you're approaching retirement, and a lot of people would say, well, Rex, you know, gee, maybe take it easy. Uh, Rex took it easy. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he established a school, a four-year uh, university-based uh, uh, educational program, because he saw that there was a necessity to professionalize the training of young people in Australia to operate in the, in the hotel and, and uh, hospitality industry. So he creates a, what becomes a world-famous school. People come from all over the world to this place in Adelaide, Australia to be trained in this industry, and what he does is professionalize it. This is not a sometime job. It's not just a, something you do casually. You go there and you really are educated on a deep level about all, all kinds of things that relate to this kind of professional life. He basically helps in Australia transfor transform this to a profession. Now you might say that that might be enough for Rex because he's getting on in years, but only in years as, as the calendar uh, counts them. He goes back to England and writes a series of history books. Well, why not? You know, at age 80, why wouldn't you think of doing that? Why wouldn't that occur to you, right? Rex has transformed himself in life about a dozen times. He's basically gone from, in, and each time he's done it with a high level success. Every one of you in this room have the capacity to transform yourself. In fact, multiple times in your life, and probably most of you ought to do it a time or two or 10 in your life. Because that's what your brain is looking for. Your brain is looking for action. It's all about having a better life at any point in life. It's all about looking forward in life and saying, how can I be stronger, more complete, more interesting, more vital? If you do the right things with your brain in life, you'll have a better life. You'll have a longer life. And you're sure as hell will have a safer life. <coughs> and what you really want to have is a brain that not, doesn't just hang in there until you pass from this mortal coil, which for most individuals, most individuals among us, it just does not do. Most of our compatriots out there die with a diagnosis of senility, right? But it's also about passing from this mortal coil full of it. And that's something I know, whatever else I can say about my friend Rex Lippmann, 
will apply to him. When he does decide to give it all in, it will be because he's taken away from us and not because he's volunteering to quit. Rex is now committed in Australia to help transform Australia and Australians to be aware of the fact that they have a plastic brain. That's his mission. And he's now, he's just written a draft of a book and the, the title of the book he's given is Don't Miss the Bus because he's pretty sure that most older Australians are, are clearly missing the bus, right? They do not understand that when it comes to their brain, to their neurology, they are in charge. And this is something that we have to educate the, uh, the citizens of our great country to understand. When it comes to your brain and your brain health, it matters to you every bit as much as does your physical health, and you are in charge. If it goes to hell, if you slide into Never Never Land, usually it's your own damn fault. And that's really the message of my book, and it's really something I think we'll talk about more later in this conversation. Thank you. All right, so um, just saying a few words of, about my work. So I uh, was blessed to have an in, in, uh, education and the whole stuff, but an incredible teacher by the name of Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. And when I listened to you talking, I remember sitting on an airplane with him where he says to me, Anat, most people don't develop past the age of two, even if they live till 80 or 90. And they live most of their life not fully alive and not fully dead. So it was a short, short cut of, right. yeah, and pretty much told me what option he thinks I should take. So, <laughs> so my work is a, a direct evolution from the work of Dr. Feldenkrais, and I was blessed to be study with him, know him from a young age, do his work from a very young age, uh, meaning practice it on myself through a dance teacher and. Um, <clears throat> and be supported by him to become my own person, which was really one of the biggest gifts he gave me. And um, so I began working initially actually with high performers because that was more my background. So it was musicians and dancers and athletes. And I loved the work because unlike well, how I was trained in clinical psychology, where we had to find a problem in a person and then try to get them out of their problem, with the work I learned with Dr. Feldenkrais, you didn't have to have a problem to get better. You just had to be alive and have a brain. And he really understood it was all about the brain and it was about brain change, brain plasticity, didn't have the terminology in those years. He didn't speak about it much because he was afraid he would be put away in an institution for a crazy person. But on long airplane flights, I heard more and more about what he really thought. And um, my, so the path went working actually with high performers to working with more regular people, but uh, still a lot of musicians, uh, you know, San Francisco Symphony, Boston uh, Symphony, all that stuff. And that, but they had trouble. People usually came to me because they had a problem. I had very few people came to me and say, I'm doing amazing, I want to do better. That's not very common. And, um, and then, for whatever history, however it went, the first child with special needs showed in my life, and she was diagnosed with global brain damage with a prognosis of d never being able to do anything, never becoming a human. And I was very lucky to be totally ignorant about pediatrics and therapy, so I just started working with her, and she started changing. So as long as she changed, I kept going, and her parents kept bringing her to me. And that's, as many of you know, is Elizabeth, who in, today is married, has two master's degrees, has a business of her own, and we email to each other from time to time, which still, every time I get an email from her, it's, it's remarkable. And her brother, when he was in his early 20s, a little bit older than her, one time took me for lunch and told me he's jealous, he's envious of Elizabeth. And I was very surprised and asked him why. He said, because she learns in a way that I can't learn the same way. And I know it's because of the work she got. And I want to be able to learn like her. What can I do? 
So you can see that you can take even a brain that's considered inferior to begin with for she's missing a good chunk of her cerebellum. It's a defect. It has a title, a diagnosis for it. It doesn't matter. And you can, with consistent and effective process, bring it to actually act as a superior nervous system because it does as well or better than other people with the challenges that are built in that you cannot change. Now, not every child I've worked with has come to quite that much of a resolution in terms of the limitations, but the work with the children has been really magical. So between working with adults and working with the children, I start asking, <laughs> what about what I do works? And I spent about 15 years, first of all, continuously being surprised at the transformational what very often people call little changes. I decided one day that there's not a small change or a big change, there's only yes change or no change. So I look for change and positive change, of course. And that uh, led to me defining some of what I realized works. And that's what eventually I wrote in my first book and got me uh, luckily to connect with Mike. And I defined as the nine essentials. And once I defined those and more and more research came online that supported the ideas behind the essentials, I got more courageous. You know, it's finally I wasn't just a little lone person in a small room doing her thing. And um, so, so then I got more courageous and I use it and I promote it to more, more uh, openly and, and clearly so the outcomes get better and faster. So, so that is what this work is about. The, the kind of the cornerstone or the main initial essential is movement, but not movement by itself, and certainly not movement as exercise, but what I call movement with attention, which is that uh, I discovered by observing other people do stuff and by observing myself and the outcomes and so on, that the moment attention to the self, attention to the feeling of self, the attention to a, 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 when somebody moves, it just seemed to drive change really, really quickly and <coughs> positive change and very often transformational change. And be, again, because of uh, the kids, uh, I've seen it in children as young, the youngest I've worked with is, was five weeks old. And, and they cha actually, those ones change really quickly, and they are very good at paying attention to what they feel. So, so that's <coughs> what um, we do, and uh, I'm very lucky to, you know, be aware of and be connected to people, and the, with all the current or the recent, I don't know, 20 years or however many years of uh, neuroplasticity research, that. Uh, I have not done the research myself at this point. It's just one research project that uh, Mike and I are co collaborating on, but that supports the assumptions behind the work. I was always also in academic background, and I, it was important, very important for me. And um, that's it. And in my answers to any questions you might have, uh, I will also try to do some demonstration either on all of you and individuals so you can see it because changes can happen really fast, really, really quickly. So let's take the first question. Let's have it uh, directed to, to uh, Dr. Michael Merzenich and we have a runner. So if you want to ask a question, please stand up. Before, before you ask a question, I want to say something I forgot to say. Uh, I have a young colleague working with me. Her name is Q Lee. And, and she's developed a program that's, on, that's mounted at um, a, a website called Brain HQ. And uh, it's an experimental program. This is not the commercial program. And anybody that would like to join this program would be welcome to for free, okay? And what it is, is 100 hours of training, okay? And, and, and it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated. It, there, are, there are embedded testing in it so that you can see how you're doing in relation to the rest of the human race. Not necessarily for you, it might be for someone that you love that you care about. And what it's about is bringing you up to speed sort of across the board. And then measuring how across the board, how completely we can transform your neurological operations to be many years younger. So what we're trying to see is if we can give a person another 10 or 15 or 20 years of headroom, you could say, in life. 
and, and provide a safe and more effective life to them going forward. It's free. You have to volunteer to do things. And if you, and so I, we have a sign-up sheet back there. If anybody would like to sign up, you know, it's uh, something that if you were to pay for it for any website, it would be many hundreds of dollars. And it's just a ton of stuff on it. And it's all in a program. You start in the beginning and you go to as long as, hopefully, f f until you finish the 100 hours. And we'll let you know in the end for your, for your participation, basically, where you're at. We'll let you know where you're at in the end in relation to where you were at the beginning. So it takes pretty much of a commitment. You've got to do this for half an hour a day, five days a week. But if you do that, I guarantee you, virtually guarantee you, you will be a different person. You'll be more neurologically effective. Now, we'll measure it in you and we'll tell you if that's true, but <laughs> and generally we don't see it. And if it isn't true, uh, gosh, <laughs> I'm going to send you to a gnat. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Mike, there. She's, the, she's my uh, therapist of last resort. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm she gets all the really hard ones. <laughs> yeah, you see, I try to make him be the, the practitioner of first resort. You know, why, why wait till things really don't work? But, but <laughs> the, the thing is, I know there are already people who are interested yeah. and they were asking how to sign up. So yeah. if you have a sign-up sheet. There's a sign-up sheet back there. Yeah, and so and it good. doesn't need to be you. If you have someone that you, you think is of an older age that you think would benefit from this, or any, any age, it's age independent. You know, there are lots of risk factors that may put you at more risk in yeah. life, things that can happen to people. And if you know somebody that has these, we're very interested in, in, in helping people that have those special risks. And because we're interested most of all of keeping people safe, in which we know they bear special risk, right? So uh, we don't, we'll keep track of them. We'll ask you, you who you are. That's part of participation. And if you, you happen to have an unusual history like that, that's great. Join in. Join the fun. And, uh, and uh, so it doesn't have to be you. It might be someone you love or care about. That's just great. I'm signing. Now, I should have said that when I was talking, but I, you know, because I'm old, you know, and forget that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so.